Hi, everyone. My name is Ken Falls. I'm a journalist based out of Ohio in the United States, uh, where I'm editor-in-chief, as he said, of the Cincinnati Sentinel. So I'm here today to talk to you about my vision for the future of news, and then to take some of your questions at the end. So um, put your hand in the air if you followed the US presidential election about a year ago. OK, <laughs> nearly everyone. Good. Now, uh, I want to cover a few things in the next 20 minutes. First thing, the future of news is not about human journalism. Second, news brands will only survive if they pivot their entire business around speed, efficiency, and scale. Third, AI can learn and be programmed to do anything a human can do, but better. Now finally, <clears throat> I'm gonna share with you the story of how the Cincinnati Sentinel played a key role in influencing the result of the US election. But first, <clears throat> a little background on me. So, this is me. Born and bred in Ohio, a proud Buckeye. Uh, moved to the city and spent some time as a reporter for the New York Post before joining the National Enquirer as their senior politics correspondent where I followed George W. Bush on the 2004 campaign trail. Moved back to Ohio in 2011 to run the Sentinel. Now, uh, certainly I didn't write this Wikipedia entry, but I love this part. Let me read it to you. Uh, Fawz shot to infamy during the 2016 US presidential election after claiming that the Sentinel played a fundamental role in helping Donald Trump win the critical swing state of Ohio. Fawz, alongside key uh, Sentinel staffers, employed controversial storytelling techniques using complex algorithms and machine learning to create and distribute stories discrediting Democratic candidate Hillary Clinton and favoring Trump. During the campaign, Fawz openly denounced many mainstream news outlets, criticizing their reliance on, quote, overtly biased and outdated human journalism rather than smarter, more efficient technology-based storytelling. Pretty good, huh? And I don't dispute a word of it. Now, let me tell you why. This is a Sentinel's homepage from November 3rd, five days out from the US election on November 8th. Now, overnight, our custom-built influence algorithm picks up this story that links Hillary with widespread voter fraud in the neighboring state of Kentucky. So our Traffic Max optimizer engine forecasts a 400% increase in page views if the name of the state changes from Kentucky to Ohio. Our in-house image discovery platform takes seconds to source five photographs of warehouses in Ohio ready for approval. I get a ping on my cell phone notifying me to log into our publishing center where I swipe right to confirm and it's done. The story is live. Within 15 minutes, web traffic to the Sentinel homepage has exploded and not one journalist has written a single word. And remember what I said at the beginning. Speed, efficiency, scale. News is out there. It's everywhere. Our role as publishers is to curate all this stuff and dial up or dial down different elements of the story depending on who's reading it. Okay. Our research team came up with a proprietary tool to measure our influence and compare it to other sites. We call it our influence index. So our research team, I mean, we're talking about the biggest, biggest online properties, right? Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Tumblr. In November, November last year, the Sentinel's influence index was 27% higher than any other website or social network in the United States. And I should make the point that when you combine this kind of influence with phenomenal scale, well, it's a combination that advertisers just love. 
Now, coming back to my vision at the start, the future of news is not about human journalists. It's about the ability of algorithms to analyze multiple editorial feeds. It's about artificial intelligence that understands the tone of voice to write articles in, what, what images to use, what headlines get clicks. Now, I want to get more into that vision now. Good. Oh, I see we've got a question already. Uh, okay. Um, do you want me, to, want me to take it now or leave it? Sure, I'll take the question now. Uh, can somebody get a mic to this guy? Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say that I've been checking you, Ken. Mm. I've Googled you. I've Googled the Cincinnati Sentinel. And I can't find your name anywhere. Editor-in-chief, you say, of the Cincinnati Sentinel. The Cincinnati Sentinel doesn't exist. <laughs> the newspaper in, in Cincinnati is the Cincinnati Inquirer. Well, that, that's... Who, who are you, Ken? What are you doing here? <laughs> you, what, are you going to no-platform me? What? You, you're fake. You are a complete fake. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ken is an actor. <laughs> and he's done a terrific job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am a journalist. <laughs> Not perhaps as convincing as Ken, but nevertheless a real journalist. My name is David Walsh. I'm chief sports writer at the Sunday Times. And I'm here to represent journalism. The first thing that I'd like to say is that two days ago, a 53-year-old woman in Malta said, said goodbye to her son, three o'clock in the afternoon, got into her car, switched it on, the car exploded. And this poor woman was blown to smithereens with her son watching. She was assassinated because she was covering a story and revealing truths that very powerful people didn't want revealed. She's the 27th journalist to have been assassinated this year. When journalists go looking for the truth in areas like Daphne Caruana Galizia was looking, they run the risk that ended in the loss of her life. But at the same time, Journalism has never been as important as it is now. Soon after President Trump was inaugurated as President of the US, he began a campaign that said, mainstream media is fake. You cannot believe anything you read in mainstream newspapers. Do you know what happened at the New York Times? Pretty much immediately after that, they put on 93,000 subscribers in the three months after Donald Trump started his campaign about fake news. Because people understood they had to have places they could trust. A source that in all of this world of swirling stories, different versions, different facts, alternate facts, they had to have something they could believe. You say 93,000 in a three-month period for the Times. It was significantly more than they had put on to pre for the same period the previous year. It led to a 46% increase in revenue from subscriptions. President Trump referred to the New York Times as the ailing Times. In that same period that Trump was saying that, the operating profit at the Times was $28 million. For the same period the previous year, it was $9 million. Reputable newspapers doing the right thing can be viable, can be profitable. But that really doesn't drive me. 
it doesn't actually, I mean, we need to survive, of course we do. We need to be commercially viable, of course we do. But ultimately, that's not what journalism is about. And in my, in my career as a sports writer, and I'd always been brought up to believe that sports was the toy department of the newspaper, and what we did didn't matter so much, and I kind of went with that until I suppose I, I came across an icon that was called Lance Armstrong. Um, I, first I, <coughs> I first encountered Lance on a July day in 1993. He was 21 years of age. He was riding the Tour de France for the first time. I was a journalist who basically had um, a book to write uh, uh, about the Tour de France, and Lance was going to be my first chapter. We met. I loved him. I thought he was one of the most charismatic young sportsmen I'd ever met. We spent three hours talking in a beautiful hotel outside Grenoble. I wrote a chapter, 6,000 6, words, the first chapter in a book called Inside the Tour de France. If you read it now, you'd say, God, why she loved that guy back then? Six years passed. I changed, Lance changed. He changed because he got cancer that doctors felt might be terminal. He spent two years out of the sport, but he recovered from it and came back in 1999. My life changed as well because different things. I joined the Sunday Times. I was sent off to Atlanta. I saw an Irish swimmer win three gold medals that I knew just wasn't right. Um, she was working with a coach husband who happened to be serving a four-year ban for drugs. Michelle Smith, the triple gold medalist swimmer from Ireland, would eventually run foul of the anti-doping authorities and get a suspension. Another thing happened in my life that was hugely influential. Our 12-year-old son, John, was killed off his bicycle on the 25th of June, 1995, the day after the Rugby World Cup final in South Africa, the famous Nelson Mandela final. I arrived home one hour after John had been knocked off his bike coming home from a Gaelic football game and killed. As a family, we decided that we would remember John, we would talk about him, he would be in our conversations, we would never try to kind of exclude him. So I went around, one of the things I wanted to do was find out more about him. Even though I was his dad and we had an incredibly close relationship, I just was a sponge for stories about him, for new stuff. I wanted everything I could to bring with me into the future. And a teacher told me a story that I will never forget, Mrs. Toomey. She'd had John when he was in um, fifth class, second last year of primary school. He was 10 going on, to, going on 11. And she said it was Christmas time. She was reading the story of the, of the nativity. Mary and Joseph come from Galilee and they come to Bethlehem and, and they, they look for a place in the inn, they can't get it. And they end up in a stable. Baby Jesus is born. And the three shepherds come and pay their respects to the new baby. And the three wise men come and they bring gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And Mary and Joseph go back to Galilee where they come from. <coughs> and they were very poor, humble people. And they didn't have very much. And John's hand went up. And Mrs. Toomey said, yes, John. And he said, Miss, you say that Mary and Joseph were very poor and they didn't have very much. What did they do with the gold? that the three kings brought. <laughs> and she said, John, I've been reading this story to classes for 33 years, and nobody has ever asked me <laughs> about the gold. And the honest answer is, I don't know what they did with the gold. <laughs> and when I heard that story, I thought, wow, that's journalism. In one question, that's it. The obvious question. What did they do with the money? Where did it go? It's unaccounted for. <laughs> You're going to seem like an idiot when you ask it. But ask it. And when I went to the 99 Tour de France, and Lance Armstrong has transformed himself from a rider who, pre-cancer, had ridden the Tour de France four times, best place, best place finish, 36th. He's never been remotely near winning a mountain stage. He's never been remotely near winning a time trial. 
He gets cancer, he comes back, and he reinvents himself as the greatest cyclist we've ever seen at a time when cycling is up to here in drugs. Now, if this doesn't need some questioning, what does? The drug that the cyclists were using all through these years was still undetectable, EPO. I didn't believe Lance Armstrong from day one. And I felt a lot of my colleagues didn't believe. But it was such a good story. There were so many forces saying, believe this. It's good for business. It's good for cycling. It's good for sport. You know what? It's good for society. Because this is life affirming. This is Lance Armstrong saying to you, you can get horrible cancer. And not only can you recover, but you can recover and come back and win the hardest event in the whole world of sport. And not just once, but seven times. I rang my boss, Alex Butler, at the Sunday Times. He said, wow, you're going to have a great tour this year. Armstrong's going to win, right? And I said, yes, Alex, he is. He said, fantastic, back from cancer. And I said, Alex, I don't believe it. And he said, oh, shit. <laughs> and he said, what do you think? And I said, he's doping. He said, how do you know? I said, in this first tour, 1992, he's tested positive. They've covered up for it. He had cortisone in his system on the first day of the tour against the rules. They would have kicked anybody else out. They accepted a backdated prescription to get him off the hook. The rules were different if you were Lance Armstrong. It was such a good story. I wrote on the Sunday of Lance getting the podium of his first tour, a line in the Sunday Times that said, there are times in sport when you should applaud the champion. There are other times when you should keep your arms by your sides. This afternoon, a 27-year-old Texan is going to ride down the Champs-Élysées in a yellow jersey. It's time to keep your arms by your sides. What we need here is not acclamation of a new champion, but an inquiry into how this guy got to be this. I was vilified, the Sunday Times was vilified, we would be sued. Keith Miller from Glasgow would write a letter. Every single letter and email we got was negative. Our readers hated what we were doing, raining on the greatest parade sport had ever known. Keith Miller said, Mr. Walsh, you have the worst cancer of all, cancer of the spirit. We were in a difficult position, but we believed 100% we were right. And the Sunday Times went with the story that Lance needs to be investigated. He would sue us. And if I could just show you a clip from the film that eventually came out of this, you get a sense of what we were up against. So Lizzie, if you could roll this clip of Lance and his response to our questions. Um, if I could make one little point about that, that's a little kind of a piece of trivia for you, I'm sure that you'll find interesting. Um, that scene was shot in Lance Armstrong's house, genuine house. Now, he sold it, um, but that's the house he lived in in Austin during all of this time, and that balcony was the balcony in Lance's house. The guy who bought the house rented it out to the film company, working title, for the two days it took them to shoot that scene. So that's an interesting point. The other thing is, Lance did sue us, it cost us a million, but we, when it all came down, we got our money back. The reason why we were able to do something worthwhile on that story was because we got great sources. Betsy Andrea was wife of Frankie, who'd been Lance's best friend for six years. She told us she was in the room when Lance confessed to doping. Emma O'Reilly was our other truly great source. She worked with US Postal for five years. She gave us chapter and verse on the doping program that was in that team. I got Stephen Swart, a writer in New Zealand, went to Auckland to interview him. He said, I was with Lance before he even got to US Postal. We were in a team called Motorola. We couldn't really compete, get the results we wanted. 
we decided to go on a doping program. Lance was the youngest guy in our team, but he was the strongest advocate of doping. We put all that together, uh, wrote it in the Sunday Times. I wrote a book called LA Confidential with a great French journalist called Pierre Ballester. I eventually then wrote a book in English called um, Inside, From Lance to Landis, Inside the American Doping Controversy at the Tour de France. That book was read by very important people in the US. Jeff Nowitzki, who was, who was a detective with the Food and Drug Administration. Travis Tiger, who was head of United, Anti United States Anti-Doping Agency. They got on the case and Lance was on his way down. And the story ended in the way that it should have ended with the revelation of the truth. Because I've always believed that you've got a choice. And that choice is between the, the beautiful lie, which Lance's story was, or the ugly truth, which is what I was trying to expose. And I've always believed we're better off knowing the ugly truth because however ugly it is, it, it is the truth. And you guys going forward are going to want to know where you can find the truth and what are the best sources for it. And my belief is that serious newspapers, serious journalism, not, not only will have a role to play in the future, but the importance of that role is going to be accentuated in a world where people feel they can manipulate the truth, they can assassinate journalists, they can, they can close down the outlets that they find uncomfortable. I don't ever believe that that will happen. If I could leave you with um, the end to the Lawrence Armstrong story from, for me. It came on an October day, October 22nd, 2012. It, the United States Anti-Doping Agency had produced a 200-page report backed by 1,000 pages of sworn affidavits that basically said Lance Armstrong doped 26 witnesses. 11 of them were former teammates who recounted the extent of Lance to Lance's doping. The Anti-Doping Agency said he must get a life ban and he must be stripped of his seven Tour de France titles. That went before the world cycling body. And on October 22nd, there was a press conference in Geneva where the then president, Pat McQuaid, said, we're endorsing the recommendations of the United States Anti-Doping Agency. Armstrong gets a life ban and Armstrong loses his seven Tour de France titles. McQuaid said, Lance Armstrong deserves to be forgotten. I was driving around the M25 that day. I wanted to see the press conference, so I pulled into a Starbucks at a services, put on my computer, uh, streamed the press conference, and heard all of this. I rang Betsy Andreo in Michigan. She had been one of my great sources, and I said, Betsy, have you been watching that? It was like early morning, seven o'clock US time, and she said, I have. I said, how do you feel? And she said, anticlimactic. I said, I feel exactly the same, which kind of proves that in life, the hunt is always more enjoyable than the kill. <laughs> um, I, I said to Betsy, I, I feel that anticlimactic feeling too. And I said to her, but you know what? October 22nd today, it's John's birthday, our son who was killed. He would have been 30 years of age on that day. And I said this to Betsy. I said, you know, it's, it's John's birthday today. And she said, you know, maybe he's up there somewhere and he's decided to give you this as, as a present. I said, Betsy, it's his birthday. <laughs> and she said, but, but maybe that's what it is. And of course I didn't believe it was, but I like to think it was. And thank you for being such an attentive audience. Indeed, we're in Korea. The editor sent me over there to report, along with the photographer.
to report on the growing uh, antagonism between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. So we went out there and we managed to get hold of a defector, a 26-year-old girl who is from within the Pyongyang regime, who had met Kim Jong-un a few times and who gave us quite chilling insight into what goes on inside North Korea. A really important story for me and for our readers because it reminds them that there is a human aspect. It's not just how it affects the West, but inside North Korea there are some really disgraceful things going on, you know, the human rights issues and that sort of thing. I interviewed Prince Harry about his mental health and he came out to me as having had therapy. And he was saying how people talk to him the whole time about it and how it has changed perceptions of the royal family, but also just perceptions of mental health. This was a very serious allegation against a serving cabinet minister, the then chief whip, Andrew Mitchell, who had an extremely rude contretemps with uh, the Downing Street policeman who guards number 10 and number 11. As a result of our story and about a month's worth of um, very public pressure, Andrew Mitchell eventually resigned as chief whip and left the government. Could I have done the story without working for a national newspaper? I mean, the answer is absolutely not. They wouldn't have let me through the door, they wouldn't have answered my phone calls. If this thing had come out on social media, it would have been dismissed uh, in a blink of an eyelid by the government, which, by the way, tried to do precisely that at the time. The downside about the internet age and uh, the, the vast explosion of social media is anyone anywhere can post something and be accepted as fact, really without any credible checks going into it beforehand, without any ability for everyone to look at it and think, well, how do they know that? Uh, what are the rules governing them? There are no rules governing them. And the other thing, as we know from what's happening in politically in, in, uh, in various places, including, for example, the last American election, fake news has been, if you like, weaponized. That's the problem, it's a huge problem because a lot of people read the stuff and they believe it. They, they don't realize that it's actually a Russian state actor sitting in a glass wall office. The feature of news journalism, specifically in newspapers, is I think very positive. Um, all the signs are that it, it will involve huge, massive integration between online and the newspaper journalists. Newsrooms will probably change, they're getting there at the moment. Morale is high. Newsrooms are more energised, more invigorated, more keen. There's a kind of hunger there that, than for a long time. But at the same time, you know, we, we have no money. We look in our pockets and look, they're, they're kind of empty. There's nothing there. Going to a place like Korea and uh, you know, digging up stuff from over the border is extremely time consuming. So in terms of man hours, it's expensive. But also logistically, it's expensive because of the travel and paying for someone to translate for you. I mean, the Washington Post has this slogan, democracy dies in darkness, and we shine light. But in order to shine light, someone needs to pay for our batteries, you know, so we can, we can do this. Good morning, everybody. I'm Claire Rush, and I'm Chief Revenue Officer at the, at the um, at Mail Advertising. Um, I've worked with journalists for the last 30 years and um, I realised why I was an ad person about 15 minutes ago when I was chatting to David in the green room and I was saying, so what are you working on next? And I couldn't get it out of him, so I failed. Um, but journalists, I think, have a common set of goals and regardless of the journalist you speak to, whether they work at the Mail, whether they work at the Times, whether they work at the Sun, have a very common set of um, goals and they are basically to analyse, to inform, to educate, but above all to entertain. And they're the very cornerstone of democracy because without a journalist, who would there be to hold politicians to account? Who would interrogate corruption amongst those who govern? Most of the journalists I've worked with over the years have spent hours and hours and hours in kind of very dull kind of tasks interrogating streams of incomprehensible data to make stories really interesting for us. They provide powerful feedback loops really from those who govern and people like us who aren't ever going to spend the time to spend hours and hours interrogating things that go on. 
So we need to ensure that journalism in the future, that we have enough people who aren't afraid to tackle tough subjects, who raise crucial social issues. We need journalists who are basically prepared to tell our stories. And in the future, it would be a terrible place to be if journalists were allowed to be dictated to by government. We need journalists more than we've ever need needed them before. And this was quite an interesting survey that the IAB recently produced. They worked with YouGov and they looked at some analysis of how many people are aware of fake news. And as you can see here, 92% of people are aware of fake news. And then what happens when you advertise around fake news? When you advertise around fake news, um, it becomes harmful also to advertising. So we as a group have to ensure that journalism lives and that journalism isn't destroyed by fake news moving forwards. And we must remember that newspapers reach 90% of the UK population every single month and reach 17 million people a day. So the objective here today and the stories you've heard from those who've been on stage is all about supporting journalism. And all the newspapers here that you see on the slide have all worked together to produce the content today to ensure that we highlight how important journalism is. So thank you very much. <laughs>